I'm usually the shirt and tie guy, but I felt like for this particular morning, it would help me communicate what I feel like I want us to talk about if I wasn't the shirt and tie guy. I don't know how you grew up going to church. Some of you went and just dressed to a T, right? Shirt, tie, jacket, maybe. Uh, others, casual from day one. So a lot of our tradition impacts that. But uh, I have a good friend who many of you know, Richard Griffin. And he once said that he made a switch from growing up very traditionally dressed as a pastor to uh, dressing more casually because he felt like at some point um, the pastor and the garb that he's wearing can be like a dividing point between him, between him and people. So like the pastor, he dresses nice. He's the guy that goes up there and wears the, the shirt and the tie and he's different than us. And uh, he called it actually emotional armor. He thought at some point the things we wear are emotional armor. You put on your like athletic equipment and you're like ready to go. You put on your tie and your dress. So you, you kind of feel like, oh, I'm not well put together. You feel less secure in yourself. And like, so he had this whole theology of it that's far more expansive than I've ever gone into it. I just grew up liking getting dressed up, going to church. Felt like a, a wonderful, respectful thing. But in this particular conversation, I don't want us to feel that there's any difference. I want to be of you and among you, uh, and I want you to identify with the things that I'm talking about as if we're just together in this conversation. So it brought to mind this scripture, and I'm just going to read it for you because it's a great segue into our topic for this morning. Uh, don't turn there, but just remember this moment when John the Baptist sent some of his disciples to talk to Jesus. Like, are you the guy? We think you're the guy. We're hearing about all these things. Is it you? And then they're going to report back to John the Baptist who's in prison. This is what that scene looks like in the book of Matthew. When Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to them, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. So as they went away, Jesus turned and began to speak to the crowds concerning John. So you know John the Baptist, right? He's eating grasshoppers and honey. He wears like a camel skin cloak. I don't have one of those, but maybe that also would have been a good way to like teach this sermon visually. You know, Elijah had his mantle that he wore. There was this kind of like prophetic look. The prophets were a wild and crazy bunch in the Bible, and they often looked pretty strange. So John was of that heritage, you know, an Old Testament prophet. So he says, um, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go into the wilderness to see? So that's where John's pulpit was. It was the riverside, the Jordan River, and it was in the wilderness. So what did you go to see? Did you go to see a reed shaken by the wind? You know, someone of like um, uncertainty, a person who kind of goes one way, then goes another, uh, weak-willed maybe, um, flighty, fickle, like someone who just goes this way and that way with public opinion? What, did, what then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? You know, like fine, expensive. Is that what you went to John for? Because he was dressed nice? Because he told you what you wanted to hear? Behold, those who wear, he's like, listen, those who wear the soft clothing, the expensive formal garb, are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet. Yeah, I tell you, he says, even more than a prophet. This is he of whom it was written by another prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, the one who will prepare your way before you. Jesus said, truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. All of us, like we're the least in the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> we're greater than John the Baptist. Like Jesus saying, those who will come after me do even greater things than I. There's this preparation in Jesus' ministry. He's preparing for like us to take over, to kick into gear and to continue his ministry. He's preparing for us, talking about us, the least in the kingdom of heaven, that's us. Somehow we're greater than John the Baptist. So all of us need camel skin cloaks. Communion will now be grasshoppers in tiny cups, Right? 
No more church building. We have to get down to the river. Is that what made John a man of God? Because he looked and dressed weird, ate gross stuff? Because, I mean, I'm, I'm fine with that. I can actually do that. I'll eat gross stuff. But would that make people love God if Dave eats gross stuff? No, they'll just think Dave's a weirdo. <laughs> what makes people love God is when something that someone says hits you, and it's like, I can't believe you just said that. And lives get changed by a word. But the word is from God through a person, a prophet. So my question to you is, are you guys prophets then? You're coming after John the Baptist. It's not about what you wear. You can dress as weird or as sane as you like. It's not about what you eat. You can eat as gross or as tasty as you like. What are people coming out to see? And for me, let me lead by example here. Did you come to just see a nicely dressed pastor saying nicely prepared words? That's not what I want to be. I want to be someone who's prayed and said, I think these scriptures are jumping off the page of me this week, so there must be some reason that you should hear them. God must have something for you to think about. So I just want to say it. And it might be for me as well. It might not be for me. Could be both. Could be neither. Could be not even for you, but you might take it and have a conversation this week, and it's for the person who gets it secondhand, like the ripples. It's fine. But that's what we're all coming to see. That's even what I'm here to see. What is God going to say to us this morning? And that's what a prophet is, just a word from God. So have any of you ever had a moment in your entire faith where you said something to someone that was a word from God to them? You have to think yes, right? At least one time, one word in your entire faith must have meant something to someone. No? I hope so. You were a prophet in that moment. You just spoke a word from God. I want us to understand what a prophet is because we need prophets. We need people to speak on God's behalf. And you don't need to give yourself a title or have a ministry organization that's a 501c3, you know, nonprofit accredited, blah, 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 blah. Did you hear God say something and you feel compelled inside you that you've got to say it to this other person? Prophet. John the Baptist John, was the least. Anyone in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. They're just big terms. Wrestle with them. I want you to own them a little bit if you're brave enough to. And so what I'd like to do is just look at a couple of definitions in the New Testament, church time, us, our time. What is a prophet? And then I'd like to look at an Old Testament example. There's actually three people who all intertwine. And there's you know, the, the professional rabbi. There's some random guy. And there's a child. And all three of them, to each other, exchange the gifts of prophecy. I want to break down... The stereotype. If you think of someone with the gift of prophecy, put that to the side. If you think pastors are the one who have like a prophetic voice, they hear what God says and then speak it to a church, just put that to the side. It doesn't have to be wrong, but it's just not the only definition. You are called to speak to the world. Every one of us. And if you're not called into a prophetic ministry, you certainly better be speaking God's thoughts to the people around you. Prophet. Okay, so that's where we're going. Those examples, and then for us as a church, as a missional church, I would like to give you a few thoughts at the very end that I feel like are for us. So consider them a thought that God's putting on my heart that I want to pass on. Kind of like the book of Revelation, it starts off, here's a message to this church, a message, we're a very particular type of church right now, trying very distinct sort of things. And I think God wants to remind us of thing, some things to keep us right on track and not get this way or this way. And so that'll be my effort to try to communicate that. But let's just talk about prophecy first. You're in 1 Corinthians. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures to lead us into it, and then we'll jump right to um, 1 Corinthians 14. So first of all, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 to 21 says, Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. But test everything. And hold fast to what is good. I think we, in our tradition and in this place in the world, I think we despise prophecies to our detriment. Someone comes up to us, I've got a word for you from the Lord. And instantly our radar goes up like, do, 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 do. all right, all right, what do you got? I'm going to take it with a grain of salt. Who is this guy to talk to me? Who is this? Like, I think we despise prophecies. I think our gut reaction, I'll speak as a born and bred New Englander, is to be like, Guilty until proven innocent. <laughs> I don't think you're speaking from God until I get enough evidence and enough time. Like, we have to be more open than that if the Spirit's going to try to talk to us. And we sit here the whole time, the Spirit's talking, 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 and we're waiting for the fruit that's going to come by our step of faith. We just need to test everything. 
on the stuff that's not good, we'll put it down. But we're going to hang on to what's good. I want to hear you guys speak to me, to Danny. We may be, we may be elders in this church, but that doesn't mean we're the only ones that God wants to talk to. We're just ones of those that God wants to talk to. And so if we feel like God put something on our heart, we want to share it. Let's do that for each other. Let's be prophets for each other. So do not despise prophecies. That's a good word for us. Uh, Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 both talk about the spiritual gifts. Uh, I'll just read the one from Romans 12. It's verses 4 through 8. It talks about the body of Christ. Uh, for as in one body we have many different members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, New Hope, church, body of Christ. So we, though we're many, are one body in Christ and members of one another. So having gifts that differ in accordance to the grace given to us, let's use those gifts. It says, let's use them. Use them. So what kind of gifts? He's about to talk. Paul's about to write to the Christians in Rome. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them. If it's prophecy, use it in proportion to our faith, like our confidence, I know this is a word from the Lord. Well, then speak as if it's a word from the Lord. If you ain't sure that it's a word from the Lord, you better say, I'm not sure if this is from God, but it may be. Can I share with you, right? Use it in proportion to the grace given you, in proportion to your faith, your God confidence in that moment with that word. Okay, but then it goes on. In serving, apportioned the grace apportioned to us, uh, show that grace in serving. If our gift is one who teaches, Show it in his teaching. If it's one who exhorts or like encourages in his exhortion, exhortation, uh, one who contributes, a giver in generosity, the one who leads, do it with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy, you know, the compassion, do it with cheerfulness. So if we believe that these are the ways that God uses the body of Christ to build each other up, then we have to accept prophecy because it's in the list. So you can't say there's no, more, no such thing as prophecy anymore that was like an Old Testament thing or that was just for the book of Acts kind of thing because then we'd have to say that generosity is a foregone thing. That being compassionate, showing mercy to people. Nope, that's, that's done away with. That gift is gone. Leadership. We'd have to say, it's, it's in the list of all these things which we know are what we need. We need people to set examples for us and help us and teach us and, and lead us. We need the people that show us what compassion really looks like. We've got the hard heart. <laughs> And then we see someone who loves gently, like, oh, you're shaming me just by your gentle heart. I need to be more like that. Like, we share these gifts. They're for each other, and they're not all the same. But prophecy's in there. So when God is speaking, don't despise it, church. The, if that gift is gone, then so are all of them, because there's no distinction made in the lift, list of gifts. List of gifts. Say that five times fast. Um, and if God could do it then, I believe he can do it now. Same God, same spirit, same opportunities. So be open to this. All right, so we'll move to the passage that I'd like to read with you. This is the definitive explanation of prophecy. It is 1 Corinthians 14. I'm going to kind of read through and just let it speak for itself. And then we're going to go back to 1 Samuel, which is our Old Testament example. And um, we're going to get to a verse in here where it says, uh, when the church comes together, each of you has something to offer, a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. That's a really beautiful definition of church. Um, coming to bring something that God's put on your heart. Coming to offer something that God is calling you to offer. And so at the very end of this message, if there's anyone here as we're talking about our church, talking about the words that God has for us. If you have something on your heart that you'd also like to share, to contribute whatever thoughts God wants us to hear, I want to make time for that at the end. It's not just whatever thoughts I have as if I'm some sort of different person. I'm one of, but these are things I hear God saying, and it may trigger thoughts in you. So whether they're affirming, whether they're corrective, whether they're alternative, suggestion, question, whatever, that's what the body, when each of you comes, you bring something. I love for our worship times to be as engaging and interactive as they can, where we all bring something to the table. So you'll see how Paul talks about that. And the way he teaches about prophecy is he compares it with speaking in tongues. So speaking in tongues is when you're speaking in another language so someone can hear you, or in certain instances when you're speaking in a prayer language for God to hear you. But it's not something that you yourself understand. It's something that's being communicated to others. Whereas prophecy is the opposite of that. Prophecy is, here's a word for God for you. It's very clear. It's like a teachable moment. 
it's meant to like wake you up instead of reach out and communicate to those who are different. It's uh, this church, hear what the Spirit's saying to the church, open your ears, that kind of thing. So this is how Paul compares and contrasts, do not despise prophecy. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. What? More than generosity, more than hospitality, more than all these other things that we especially prophecy? Why? Why should we want that? Why does the church need that? Why does the world need truth spoken to it? That might be self-evident right now if you turn on the TV. Why does the world need a word from God? Just saying, that might be pretty relevant right now. Why do people need God to speak to them and show them that they're there? Like, desire the gifts we may see God at work, especially prophecy. For comparatively, one who speaks in a tongue, a foreign language or a prayer language, he speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him. He utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and their encouragement and their consolation. So one who speaks in a tongue builds himself up, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, Paul says, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? If even lifeless instruments, such as a flute or a harp, do not, or do not give distinct tones, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So with yourselves. If with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? You'll be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of that language, I'll be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray for the power to interpret it. Explain it. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you're saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and lips of foreigners will I speak to this people. Even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. While prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. Therefore the whole church comes together, if therefore the whole church comes together, and all speak in tongues, and an outsider or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you're out of your minds? But if all prophesy, an unbeliever outsider enters, he's convicted by all and he's called into account by all. The secrets of the heart are disclosed. And so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. What then, brothers? And this is what I hinted at before. What then, brothers? When you come together, each one has a hymn or a lesson, a revelation, a tongue or interpretation, and let all things be done for building up. If anyone speak in a tongue, let there be two, or at most three, and each in a turn, let, and let someone interpret. But if there's no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak, and then let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent, for you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all be encouraged. For the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets." You know, when we're led by the Spirit, it, it's not going to be in a way that we can't then say, well, is this the right time for this? Or how do I communicate this? It's not sort of like an overwhelming expression that we're not capable of, of controlling. Or Prophecy is communication. It's teaching. Teaching is a form of prophecy. Preaching is a form of prophecy. I heard a word from the Lord for you is a form of prophecy. Reading a scripture and saying, wow, it's jumping off the page at me is a form of prophecy. So Paul's building the argument here that when we come together, we want to hear a word from the Lord. 
And if we find ourselves in the world and God gives us manifestation of speaking in tongues, that's going to be a sign for the outsiders when someone hears us speaking and says, wow, that's them talking to me, just like happened in the book of Acts. And if we find ourselves in our prayer closet and we're speaking in the tongues of men and angels, as we see in scripture, and our mind is unfruitful, but we're pouring out our spirit to the Lord, well, then let that be our prayer language. Let that be how we communicate. When we come together, let's do whatever we can to build one another up. Now, the reason I say all this, the reason this is on my heart, is because we, in this time of our church, need to be speaking to each other prophetically more than we have in the past. Why do I say that? <laughs> because we're all living these kind of like microcosms of the church on our own, our missional communities. And if we have pockets of believers where no one there is saying, I think God is saying this to us, then that entire missional community will be guided by the whims of the people in it, not by the Holy Spirit. We won't find any fruit. We won't see any blessing. We won't find God honoring it if it's just us kind of throwing a dart at a dartboard and wondering if stuff work out. We actually need prophets to speak into that moment. In our missional communities, where we find ourselves together with friends, if one of us says, I'm really struggling with this or with that, well, what does the Lord have to say to that person? Minister to them. Don't pick up the phone and say, I'll call Dave or Danny. That's the separation that we're not looking for. We're looking for book of Acts. My spirit will be poured out on all people. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. Prophecy, just speaking from God. And if we fall into the trap too much that that's for someone else, or if we think gift of prophecy is a very specific sort of thing that people with a certain calling or in a certain thing will use, we might not be listening for the Holy Spirit to tell us what we need to say to each other. So I'm just asking us to listen equally to what God will say. The great example of this, like I said, is in 1 Samuel. And there are three people who kind of alternate the gift of prophecy between each other. We're in 1 Samuel. We'll start in uh, chapter 1. I want to kind of skim through the very beginning to get to verse 17. That's kind of where we're really starting. If you remember Samuel's story, he was never supposed to be born. He's one of those children of promise. Like he, he, His mom couldn't get pregnant. He was not supposed to be uh, their child. He was not supposed to be born. And so they go to the temple year after year, and she's praying, asking God, please, I'm barren, please give me a child. This is her prayer. So we see that she's praying in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 9. Um, they rose, and it says, now Eli the priest. So this is a person who's supposed to sit in the seat of speaking the word of the Lord, right? The priest. It is their job to try to communicate Prophecy, words from the Lord, truth, teaching, sacrifices, it's his role. And Eli is kind of an up and down example. He doesn't always fulfill his role, but in this case, he does. He's spot on. And maybe he didn't even mean to be, which is interesting, as you'll see. Eli the priest was sitting on, this, on his seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. And she was distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly and prayed, you know, I'll give my son to you for all the days of his life. But verse 12 says, as she continued praying, Eli observed her mouth. She was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved. Her voice was not heard. So Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah answered, no, Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I've drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I've been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I've been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. And here's the word from the Lord. And then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant, you, grant your petition that you have made to him. So I don't know if Eli was like, Go in peace. Go in peace. <laughs> or if he like felt it in that moment, like, Go in peace. God has this. We don't know, but he was speaking on behalf of the Lord because we know that Hannah instantly heard that those words were from God for her. Because what happens in the next verse? She said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. And the woman went away and she immediately ate. You know, she couldn't eat because she, now she's just like feasting. I feel good. I'm hungry again. Her appetite returns. Her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. They went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. It's not Eli's prophecy that makes things come true. It's what God wanted to say to his daughter about the baby she was about to have. And so God fulfills his power, his plan. The Lord remembered her. Verse 20, in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She called his name Samuel. I have asked for him from the Lord. So there's a first example. And whether he knew what he was saying or not, he was in the place for God to speak through him. 
And that's kind of a beautiful thing, too, if we don't even always know when God's speaking through us, but we're willing to speak, willing to serve. We just speak what God puts on our heart. You don't always know how things happen. So 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 26. Samuel has been brought back. He now lives at the temple. His mother dedicated him there, just like Samson. He got a vow. He's never going to cut his hair. And God uses Samuel. He's one of the most significant people in the Old Covenant. Tremendous legacy. But anyway, verse 26, you see he's a young man. Now the young man Samuel continued to grow both in stature and favor with the Lord and man. Now verse 27, we have this anonymous guy who shows up. Now there came a man of God to Eli, to the priest, and said to him, thus says the Lord. So a non-priest comes to the high priest and is like, this is what God's saying to you. So sometimes man of God can kind of be a title for a prophet. So maybe he was one of these prophets that kind of traveled in the area. Or maybe he was just a man of God. Men of God? Women of God? This can be you. You can come and speak to a priest, a pastor. You can speak to a stranger. You can be a titled person or an anonymous person. God's not just looking for people in positions to use. He's looking for his faithful priesthood of all believers. And so here in this case, he's like, my high priest who should know better, I'm going to grab this guy. Go talk to him because he needs a word from the Lord. So the man of God comes to Eli and says, thus the Lord has said, didn't I reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt? To the house of Pharaoh, didn't I choose him, the tribe of Levi, where all the priests come from, didn't I choose him out of all the tribes to be my priest, to go to my altar? Why then, verse 29, why do you scorn my sacrifices? Verse 30, I promised that your house would go on before me forever, but the Lord declares, far be it from me. Those who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Eli evidently is resting on his lineage. He's like, I'm of the priestly clan. I'm good. I'm a Christian. I grew up in a Christian house. I went to church. Like, he's just resting on the reputation. He's resting on the heritage, the faith of his forefathers. And God's like, no, he who honors me, I will honor. Can we hear that, church? That speaks to us. He who honors me, I will honor. God's in this, like, reciprocal business. <laughs> he wants to be engaged with us. He's not going to just do it for us. And he's not going to just do whatever we want and be like, oh, I'll honor that. I'll honor that. No, honor God, and he'll honor us. That's what he said to the man of the priest by the man of God. And actually, there's this young boy who's kind of like listening on. And God had a word for the young boy as well. Chapter 3, verse 1 of 1 Samuel. And this is where we're going to see the third example of prophecy and how they intertwine. And I hope you can all see yourselves in one or more of these prophetic moments. 1 Samuel 3, 1. Now, the young man Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli now, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There were no frequent visions. So it's speaking to the general state of spirituality at his time. Not many people were having visions. Not many people were seeking the Lord in that way, not hearing much. A dry spiritual time. But God was still at work. He's about to break in. If we find ourselves in a culture or a time or a place where there aren't many visions, where it feels dry spiritually, that's not the end. That's not a permanent condition. We pray for God to break in and to use us. Well, he breaks in through a boy, a young boy. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim, was lying down in his own place. Verse 4, the Lord called to Samuel and said, here I am. But he went and it was Eli. And Eli said, no, I didn't call you. This happens three times, right? Before we see what God says to Samuel. Look specifically at verse 7. In this process, it describes Samuel. It says, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. We should have heard a lot about him. He lives in the temple 24-7. But he didn't know him. There is a difference. And we want the second one, church. We want to know when God's speaking to us and not think that it's some man or some woman or some author, pastor, book, whatever, friend. We want to know when God's saying, child, tap, tap, tap. Right? And so Eli gives instruction. But in that moment, it says, Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. So he's waiting, he's learning, he's growing. God's about to break in. So the Lord called to Samuel a third time. He arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am for you, called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the young man and mentoring happens here. He says, Ah, I've been in this situation before. I know what this boy needs. Go back and tell God I'm listening. Whatever you tell me, I'll do. So he teaches him. This priest who's getting it wrong at least knows what's right and tells the boy, this is how you listen to the father. When he calls to you, this is what it looks like. Say, I'm listening. Anything you say, I'm going to do. This is what prophecy looks like, church. 
still, I think I hear you saying something, Father. What is it? Tell me. I want to know. Whatever it is you'll do, you tell me, I'll do. Revelation, that's the beginning of the prophetic moment. So Eli gives that advice. Verse 9, Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down if he calls you. You shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. The next verses, God reveals to Samuel that he is going to exact punishment on Eli's family and it is going to make the ears of everyone who hears it in the nation tingle. It's going to be shocking. He who honors me, I will honor. He who despises me shall be lightly esteemed. He goes back, he tells Eli. And in verse 19, after the scene comes to a close, it says, Samuel grew and the Lord was with him. And he let none of his words fall to the ground. It's like when he said something, it, it had weight, it carried. It went somewhere. He didn't let any of his words be like, blah, blah, psh. <laughs> no, they, they had life. He didn't let any of the words of Samuel fall to the ground. And all of Israel, verse 20, from Dan to Beersheba, from coast to coast, <laughs> right? They knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. So, teenagers, I think maybe, Ava, you're the only one here this morning, <laughs> lets you and I have a talk. There's no reason why you can't speak to all of us whatever God wants us to hear. There's no age limit. There's no graduation requirement. There isn't even the ability, the need to like be able to explain it or define it. You just know it, and then you speak it. That's Samuel's story. He didn't get any of it. He was a little kid. So don't sell yourself short for being young. And for those of us who are young in our faith, how many years do you think you have to be a Christian before you could speak for the Lord? We kind of think, well, after I've been walking with the Lord for a while and I've learned more of what I need to, you know, we feel young in our faith. Does that matter? Maybe for the testing and the discernment, because we might not know yet what it feels like. Maybe we need an Eli to come over us if we're young in our faith and be like, well, this is how I would walk through that. Figure out if this is God speaking or not. But we better be listening because we have the high priest there who should have known better. The mature Christian who wasn't listening to the Lord. The mature Christian, the person in the prophetic role, had the title and the position and the seat by the door, like that guy. That didn't guarantee that he would be a man of God. God had to actually recruit an anonymous man of God to go talk to the one who should have known. So we're the ones that should know. And whether we're a longtime Christian, whether we're physically, age-wise, young, whether we're young in the faith, our job is to not despise prophecies because who doesn't want to hear from God? We just don't think of it in terms of prophecy. You know, the word prophetic sort of means... Um, the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for a prophet is uh, an announcer. So literally someone who just proclaims something from God. We always kind of attach it to like future telling. <laughs> like I'm a prophet, so tomorrow at 12.30 this thing's going to happen. But it doesn't have to have that meaning. It's just a word from God. Now if God knows that tomorrow at 12.33 there's going to something, then he'll warn. And prophecy can just be a word from God. But sometimes the word from God is just, remember when you had all that passion in your faith? Yeah, about that. It's getting a little dry, isn't it? And when God speaks that to us, it kind of fires us up again. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I don't want to grow dry. A dusty old Christian. I want to be alive. I want to bear fruit. Regardless of my age or my length of salvation. Those aren't the qualifications. So there's prophecy. You think about Elijah. He comes out of nowhere. If you ever want to read about him, 1 Kings 17. Think about Jonah. Like he knew it was going to happen, but it wasn't so much about what was going to happen. It was Nineveh. This is what you need to hear. So Moses is a prophet because he's like, this is what God's saying to you. Whenever we act that way towards one another, we elevate the gift of prophecy. Don't despise it. Embrace it. Pray for it. Test it. Work together so that we may build each other up because we need to know what God is saying to us. More so now than ever. More so now than ever. As we find ourselves as the scattered church and as small groups of believers, we need to know what the Bible is saying to us. We need to know what the Spirit is saying to us. We need to know what the Father is leading. And you know what? Even if we had a hundred different missional communities that never spoke to each other, if every single one of them was following the Spirit, when we gathered together, we would have had the same thought. 
And how cool is that? Because that's what God's saying to the church. So he'd say it to 100 different places, and they'd come together and be like, God said that to you, and you, and you, and you, and you? This is amazing. Well, no kidding. It's God. It's got to be amazing. He's amazing. And yet we settle for sort of like a tame version of God speaking to his people. Don't. Don't settle. I'm urging you and calling you, please, do not settle. Let God speak to us. So here is where I stop. I feel like we've defined prophecy. I have challenged you as much as I'm going to you. It is going to be up to you to take it and do something with it. It is out of my hands now. It's between you and the Father. And that's an exciting thing because who knows what God could do with every single one of us. But the thoughts that I would like to share to you, and if you have any to add to this at the end before we close our service in some more worship, have to do with us staying on track as a missional church. I feel like in these baby steps of as we're growing and, and exploring and seeing God move, it is critical that we stay locked in to the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Because if we don't, we're going to find ourselves weaving, and we have to get. So this is my call to recenter, and these are the things that I feel are most important for us. So you may find that one or more of these is what you need to hear. I don't know who needs to hear what, but I know that these are the thoughts which I'm supposed to share with you this morning. So there's just a few of them. The first one is something we talked about actually at Missional Community, uh, actually no, at the um, Missional Community Leaders Meeting just yesterday. The point of everything we're doing is to glorify God and lead people to him. The point is to build the kingdom by making disciples. That is the purpose. Love God and bring people to him. If our missional communities are not bringing people to faith, then we're falling short of our calling. Are our home groups bringing people to a place where they say we need Christ in our life? If we're just staying as groups of Christians loving God, then we're halfway there, maybe. We're glorifying God, but we are to call people into the kingdom. And if our missional communities do not bring people to Christ, then it's just Christian clubs. It's not what we do. And that requires meeting more people who don't know the Lord to invite them. It requires remembering why we're doing what we're doing. So if our missional communities are not bringing people to Christ, there's no fruit. We may be growing in our maturity, but we're already saved. We're not the mission. We're the missionaries, right? So please stay on track with what our focus needs to be. Introduce people to Jesus. Invite them. If our church gatherings here are not bringing people to Christ, then they're falling short. And we need to challenge, are we, should we be gathering? What's it for? It can encourage us and help us glorify, but it's meant to make disciples. That's what the church is here for. So refocus point. We are here to spread the gospel. We're not here just to enjoy it. Now, the second part with that is, if we're going to invite people, like Paul said, the things you have heard from me and seen in me, put them into practice. It means we're inviting people to become like us, to think like us and to act like us. If you invited someone into your home and said, act like us, what sort of person would you turn them into? Who would they become? This is the biggest criticism Jesus has of the Pharisees. He says, you go over heaven and earth to gain a convert, and then you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourself. Jesus' words, not mine. If you invite someone to imitate your prayer life, what are you inviting them to become? If you invite them to come and sit at your dining room table with your family, who would they become by sitting in that place? If you invite them into your missional communities, who will they grow to be? If we invite them to our services, well, what are we inviting them to? We have to be there first. Love God, then love your neighbor. Right? Love God, worship. Let's get close to the Father and help each other get there so that we have something that's worth inviting anybody to in the first place. Please stay on track with where we need to be so that there's something valuable to invite someone to join in. The things you've heard from me and seen from me, put them into practice. Third point. I think as we're looking to reach out, we think of people, think of Joshua going to the promised land. We think of the people around us more like giants <laughs> that are too scary and we're going to lose versus the promised land that God has given to us. Has God or has God not put on our heart to reach out more? He has. 
I'm confident of that. That means that the people he puts in our path are the things, the promised land that he's given to us, not the giants that are going to defeat us. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of talking to anyone. Don't be afraid of reaching out to anyone. You will find that the places that God leaves you, leads you will bear fruit because he's actually given them to us as our promised land. Those conversations are promised land promises. Those people are promised land people. Those missions and outreaches are pro- they're prepared. If God's behind it, then it's the place he's calling us to be. So don't think of them like giants. What will my neighbors say? Well, if God's leading you there, he's actually been working on your neighbor's heart and your neighbor can't wait for you to say the thing that you're afraid to say because you think they're a giant instead of the promised land. So just don't be afraid. If God's leading, then he's also paving the way before. Not giants. Don't look at it like, look at it like promises. Look at it like gifts waiting to be opened. Every conversation, every outreach, every home gathering, every chapel gathering. Don't be afraid. Just a couple more. And then if God puts anything on your heart, I'd love for you to share it as well. Your gifts are your language. Speak that. Your, 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 your gifts. Uh, world, internet. Your, your gifts are your language. Too many of us feel inadequate because we try to use someone else's gifts to build the kingdom. We hear a preacher and we like how they say it, but we can't exactly remember how that, that person said it. And we read the scripture, but we don't have like a good enough memory. We can't quite remember that verse. Well, are you called to be a teacher in a certain moment? Are you called to be an evangelist? Maybe, but maybe you're just called to be generous. Gift of generosity. Maybe just a word from the Lord. You know what the word from the Lord could be? God loves you. Who cooks, who serves, who loves, who has compassion, who opens their home, who listens. Use your gifts. Don't use my gifts. Don't try to imitate someone else's gifts and think that that's going to give you fruit in the kingdom. Be who you are. Love people your way, the way God's made you. Then all of a sudden it'll start to work because you're being you, the way the Holy Spirit has filled you and equipped you. And that brings me to the last point. With God's strength, like, you are enough. You're enough. You are sufficient because it doesn't depend on you. <laughs> it's God's strength and he's in you so you can. You will. You're capable. You're equipped. You're prepared. You're fulfilled. You are filled. You're sufficient. Because God's not going to fail in his purposes. And he's choosing to use us and how amazing is that? And he will choose to use us. So don't worry about getting back up. Don't worry about someone else who could do it better. Don't worry about waiting for the perfect moment. Just do. Just be. And God will build the kingdom. These are the thoughts I know I want to remind us of. Things we already know, but please don't forget who and what we are and what God's called us to do. Music team, would you come forward? Is there anyone else that, before we close with a song, wants to share a word from the Lord to our church to continue to either challenge us or exhort us? Is anything popping into your mind? Sandra, please. Would you take off your mask just so we can hear you a little better? So yesterday we had our meeting discussing Serve Home. There you go. That'll help people on Zoom. Cookout afterwards. And I I might be wrong here. So... um, and we were kind of discussing what would we do with the food. And I just thought, I don't think we should worry about that right now. I think we should just go ahead and... And then this morning I was thinking, you know, this, we serve. And one of the... We serve, you know, our, our neighbors. Yeah. Um, and one of the things in our missional community is, is we help the helpers. So I was thinking there are so many restaurants and caterers in the area that would probably love to do this. Mm. You know, that would, and we just have to reach out and let mm. them know, this is, we're going to be in your neighborhood serving one of your neighbors. Would you like mm. to help us help them mm. by, by sharing your loaves and fishes? Mm. This is what they do, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm going to make some calls, but... Right. And you all might be hangry on that morning. Yeah. Like, Barry will buy us all pizza if it all falls through. But, <laughs> but I just have this feeling that Good. something's going to happen. And Good. there'll be plenty of food. Good. And that's using your gift in proportion to your faith. You have that feeling. And so we test it out. I've had lots of great ideas that never turned into anything over the years. Right? But you don't know unless you follow. But if it's an idea from the Lord, you want to find out. And when, but if you think of all those restaurants as giants... 
oh, they wouldn't want to. And no one, then you're never going to find that one connection where someone's like, I would love to. It's 100 people. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Great yeah. I enjoy that. Cool. That's the way of sharing. So. It's a great example of letting the Spirit lead. Thank you, sister. Any other thoughts that our church needs this morning? I think Larry? I just to wanted to say um, <clears throat> if we could just say a prayer at the end of this service for our brothers and sisters over in India who are greatly suffering right now. And they are such good people, the ones I've come in contact with, and I'd like to pray for them uh, at the end of the service if we could. Let's, let's stop now. Let's just pray now. Let's just pray now. Holy Spirit, thank you for your church that knows no racial boundaries, no no age boundaries, knows no gender boundaries, knows no skill boundaries, no intelligence boundaries, no nationality boundaries. Uh, you love are available and calling to all. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would bring your manifestations of healing, of wisdom, of protection. Father, send your angels to our brothers and sisters, and even those who don't know you. May the rain fall on the just and the unjust. May you give mercy to those people who you love, whether they love you back or not. And for all of our brothers and sisters in that specific part of your creation, that little corner of the world where so many people live and so many of your people live, I pray that you'd give them opportunities to love their neighbor as themselves. May your church rise up in that place and love like you love, and help like you help, and be a word from you to the people around them. So ask your blessing and your protection. Spirit, pray that you'd move in that country through your church, and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Nikki, did you want to add something? I saw your hand up there. Yeah, steal the mic and go for it. Um, just was thinking this morning, and Brennan can probably attest this, I just had one of those mornings where I was like, I really felt like I should get out of bed and like be prepared for the day. Mm. And it, it didn't happen, <laughs> which is sometimes really good for me too. But um, just like this feeling that I woke up with, and I know every person sitting in this church this morning has those mornings, and I feel like a lot of times it happens on Sundays where we like struggle to, you know, get out the door or something happens. And, um, but I just, I just feel like whatever it is, the, the words that you're giving today, I just feel like they must be incredibly powerful. I just think about like Michaela down for the count with Mono, you know, Danny just not feeling well either. And just, you know, the series of unfortunate events that's <laughs> comical right now that happened this morning. Why like your wife isn't here and I was trying to get Piper and I lost my car keys and like just all the weird things that happen on a day like today it just yeah. made me really just want to pay attention and really just say that I feel like everybody this might be a sermon that we should all go home and listen to again at some point this week because I feel like this only happens when you have the best words to say I know it is so. we fight against <clears throat> things that are unseen so all those coincidences of things going wrong that's not coincidence at all so thank you for that I agree yeah I could share with you too from my perspective that until Friday or Saturday of this week, I didn't even know what the sermon would be. So that's one of those interesting weeks for me where I'm praying and asking every day, but nothing's becoming clear. I just kept having these random thoughts. I feel like the church should hear this, but none of them was a sermon. And I, I, I would like go a little bit explore. Should I preach? No, I just didn't feel the spirit doing anything of that. That's just, like... and then woke up yesterday and realizing, no. We actually need to dig into the Spirit and hear these thoughts, and we need to be challenged that God is trying to speak these thoughts through each of us, not just waiting for a pastor on a first and third Sunday. This is the body of Christ. So even how it came about as a sermon this week wasn't well thought out, wasn't like, oh, I've been preparing for two weeks, I had no idea, and I kept trying to find the sermon and couldn't. So yes, I think this is what God needed us to hear. And uh, like the book of Revelation says, before we close, uh, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Please rise as we close with song.